Good morning. Welcome to St. John's this Palm Sunday as we celebrate our Savior King who rode into Jerusalem humbly and willingly to, to suffer and die for the sins of the world. We follow the, the order of service of the word this morning and we begin our worship by singing hymn 716, No Tramp of Soldiers Marching Feet. Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him, and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him, and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin 
and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. praise you, O God, for the great acts of love by which you redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ, as he was acclaimed by those who scattered their garments and branches of palm in his path. So may we always hail him as our King and follow him with perfect obedience, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. First scripture lesson, which is also the sermon text this morning, is from the prophet Zechariah, chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and brings salvation. He is humble and is riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow will be taken away, and he will proclaim peace to the nations. His kingdom will extend from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. This is the word of the Lord. We join in singing Psalm 24. Um, all the congregation will sing the refrains and the gloria. I'll sing the first half of each verse. The congregation will sing the second half of each verse.
second lesson is Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Indeed, let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Though he was by nature God, he did not consider equality with God as a prize to be displayed. But he emptied himself by taking the nature of a servant. When he was born in human likeness, and his appearance was like that of any other man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Continue with the junior choir anthem. reading of the gospel. Gospel for Palm Sunday is Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. As they approached Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and told them, go into the village ahead of you. As soon as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this, say, the Lord needs it, and he will send it back here without delay. They left and found a colt on the street tied at a door, and they untied it. Some who were standing there asked them, what what are you doing untying that colt? The disciples answered them just as Jesus had instructed them, and the men let them go. They brought the colt to Jesus, threw their garments on it, and Jesus sat on it. Many people spread their garments on the road. Others spread branches that they had cut from the fields. Those who went in front and those who followed were crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. This is the gospel of our Lord.
to you in peace from God our Father and from our Savior, Jesus Christ. God's word for our meditation this morning is our Old Testament lesson from the prophet Zechariah, chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. Your brothers and sisters in Christ. What's going on? What is all the fuss about? Maybe it's a teacher on the schoolyard seeing a group of kids all gathered around something and they can't tell what. Maybe you've been driving down the highway and all of a sudden all the cars just start slowing down for some reason and you can't tell why. Or maybe it's on social media and all of a sudden your Facebook feed or your Twitter account is flooded with some joke that you don't understand. I mean, if you didn't understand, if you didn't know that there was a, a ship stuck in the Suez Canal, you probably wouldn't understand half the memes coming across social media these days. Sometimes we might wonder, what did they understand? What did they know there in Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday? Did the people understand what they were really crying out? Did they understand who it was who was coming into the city on that donkey? Did they know why they were shouting Hosanna? Did they really believe it? Perhaps the more important question for us today is, do you? Do we understand what Palm Sunday is about? Do we understand why it's such a big deal? Do we understand why we too sing Hosanna? Do we understand why across Christendom people will still wave palm branches on this day? Through the prophet Zechariah, we do. He urges Jerusalem and us to rejoice, to rejoice greatly. And then he gives us all the reasons why. It hardly seems like it was over 20 years ago now uh, that we had a presidential election that ended with a court case. All the votes were cast, and then, well, now the courts have to decide who actually won. It seems like that happens more and more in politics these days. But the point for us here this morning is no matter who was declared the victor, there's going to be somebody left who says, well, I don't think so, or he's not my president. Come to think of it, that doesn't change much, even as things change in our world, does it? That's often the case throughout our lives, isn't it, in many small ways? We look at our boss and we say, I could do my jo that job better than him. We look at people in certain positions of authority and we say we can find all of their faults and we can find all the reasons why they shouldn't be there. We point out the mistakes made by our teachers or we find ourselves saying I could do that job better than him. None of us can claim perfection in anything we do, can we? Even the things we are very best at. But that's especially true when making a claim before a perfect God. Who of us can claim that we have any standing before him? The best that we can do is try. To, to try to be good, to try to be our best. That was the thought that filled a lot of hearts and minds on that first Palm Sunday. See, there were pilgrims on their way into Jerusalem. Many of them had selected the very best sheep that they had in their flock. The, the most perfect that they could find, but it wasn't perfect. Others would go to the marketplace and try and find one there, and I imagine that selection was even more picked over. Unblemished lamb without defect? Hardly. None of them were perfect. But then again, neither are your offerings. Neither is your worship. Neither is the service that you can give to the Lord. It's not perfect. It's tainted. It's sinful. But rejoice greatly. Because the one who was on his way into Jerusalem that day is righteous. And that makes him the only one who can be the sacrifice that is demanded for sin. Little did they know that as they, they, they dragged along their lamb on the way to Jerusalem, those pilgrims on that day, 
The lamb who would fulfill all the lambs was there on a donkey in front of them on his way into the city. Even with all of the hubbub, it would have been easy to mistake Jesus for a nobody. Even those who watched, even those who sang, maybe come Friday said, oh, well, that was kind of fun while it lasted, but I guess it turned out to be nothing. But what a mistake they would have made. What a misunderstanding they would have had. Because Jesus is not only righteous, but he is also victorious. He comes and he brings salvation, Zechariah tells us. He accomplished what was necessary for salvation. He did what was demanded of you. He lived perfectly. And he took that perfect life and offered it up as a payment for your sins. It was easy to mistake Jesus on that day. Even with the crowds. Even with the acclaim. But there will be no mistaking Jesus when we see him again. Then he will be righteous and bringing salvation, but coming on the clouds of heaven with all the glory of heaven. Then we will know, then we will see. As our epistle text said, every knee will bow on that day. Even those who pierced him will bow down to him. Rejoice greatly. Your king is righteous and victorious. And yet, even his lowliness, his humility, is a reason for us to rejoice. Scholars have debated the meaning of the donkey. Growing up, I always learned it was a sign of humility, and yet some scholars will say that it actually was in Israel a sign of kingship, that other kings rode on donkeys too. But Zechariah makes it a moot point because he he himself writes, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble and riding on a donkey. He, He points out it's a sign of humility. Even if it is a sign of kingship, it's a sign of humble kingship, lowliness. We might ask, why is that a reason to rejoice? Why is why is humility and lowliness a reason to rejoice? It's a reason for us to rejoice greatly because by every bit of our own understanding, it doesn't seem like Jesus should be there. He's there willingly. He has humbled himself. He's lowered himself. He's not there by force or by compulsion. He chose to do that for you. He chose to enter into the city. He chose to be arrested and beaten. He chose to lay down his life for you to suffer and to die. Can you say that about anyone else? True, there are those who give up their lives, kings even, who give their lives on the battlefield, who lay down their life for their people, but any one of them would trade that. Wouldn't they prefer not to lay down their life? And who of them would lay down their life so that no battle would have to be fought? Nothing left for us. Not simply dying at the hands of the enemy, but dying to defeat the enemy. See that loving humility on display as our king rides humbly into Jerusalem for us. It goes against our sinful pride, against our, our, our desire to see success, to see victory in our lives and in, in things around us to rejoice in a donkey riding king. He doesn't seem good enough for us some of the time. He doesn't seem good enough when we have enough trouble holding on to our job that maybe pays donkey level wages. Or when we, uh, when we can't afford the donkey quality car that we have or afford our donkey quality house or apartment. When things aren't great, when things aren't what we want them to be, that's when we want a king who comes riding on a chariot with a a majestic war horse. That's the king that our sinful hearts want. One who wins a victory we can see here. One who gives us all that our heart desires. 
but rejoice. Rejoice greatly, O Zion. Rejoice greatly, children of God, because your king humbly came for you, riding on a donkey. No, on the contrary to those kings and rulers with military might, who come with their armies behind them, our king comes to remove all the need for weapons of war. Maybe you've heard of world leaders meeting to determine how many battleships they can have, how many warships in their navy, how many nuclear weapons they can have, and they, they disarm, they, they, they put away some of their weapons and destroy them to keep things balanced. But long before arms talks of the 20th century, Jesus came to disarm his own people. And that seems strange to us, doesn't it? Well, wouldn't they be vulnerable if he takes away the weapons of his own people? But you see, he takes away those weapons because they aren't needed anymore. It's a reason for us to rejoice. Our battle is over. Our battle is done. We don't need to wage the war against sin with our own strength, with our own might. We don't need to fight against the world with any strength that we can muster. Our Savior has won the victory for us. No matter how strong we think we are, no matter how much we think we can do it, Satan is going to overpower us and the world is going to outnumber us. And our sinful flesh is going to lie to us and deceive us. The only recourse we see is revenge. The only weapon we have is our own strength, our own hands, our own wits, our own plans. But you see, just as a nation without enemies has no need for weapons of war, so Christ has freed us from our dependence upon our need for weapons of war, our own might. And what a freedom that is. It's a freedom now to live for him and serve him because we know that our enemies have already been defeated, even, even as they lurk around us. And he continues to win the victory. He continues to fight the battle for us, winning one heart at a time, not with force or compulsion, but with the beautiful promises of his gospel, with the forgiveness of sins that changes hearts and then changes minds. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Your king has removed the need for weapons of war. Knowing what we do about the week that lies ahead for Jesus, it seems strange to say that he comes to bring peace. Because that week was hardly a peaceful week. There was conflict. There were, was plotting. There was violence. And of course, it would end in his death. But you see, peace, peace is what he came to bring. Even as we follow Jesus every year on into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, knowing the violence that is about to befall him, seeing the hatred and the contempt that lies there for him, we know that our king has a kingdom that is not of this world. We know that he has come to win us from this world to eternal life with him, with his Father in heaven. He came to save us from this world. And so we follow into Jerusalem and we witness his gruesome crucifixion because we know that that awful cross, in that awful cross, we have peace. Peace with our Heavenly Father. Satan's grip on our souls is shattered. His grip on our future is gone. The gates of heaven are flung wide open for us, for all mankind. And that peace fills us with a daily confidence. Even if our life is in ruins, even when the crosses that we bear feel heavier than, than what we can manage, we hear the preaching of the Apostle Paul who says it's through many hardships that we enter into the kingdom of God. And we know that our Savior has brought deliverance for us. He has proclaimed peace. 
we have peace with God. And those hardships, they're just a shadow of the cross that Jesus bore for us in our place. They are signposts on our path to eternal life, eternal peace with our Heavenly Father. Children of God, rejoice greatly. Your King comes. Shout for joy with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your spirit. Let your voices sing praise to our Heavenly Father. Because he's given us more than enough reasons to sing and shout. He has given us faith. And by faith we see him as he is. By faith we understand what he has done. And the day is coming when we will not need faith anymore. Because then we will see him with our own eyes. We will not need to trust on what he will bring to us because he will give it to us. Our king who rode ahead into Jerusalem rode ahead to win a victory for us. And he will come again to bring us that victory in eternal glory. Amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join to confess the Christian faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In the prayer of the church this morning, we pray for the Lindemann family. Pastor Lindemann's father, Reverend Ed Lindemann, has been diagnosed with an inoperable brain tumor. We pray. Lord Jesus, you are the King of heaven and earth. We join the first Palm Sunday worshipers in praising and glorifying you for coming to this earth to be our Savior. Though you are one with God the Father and Lord of all, you humbled yourself and became one with us. Thanks be to you for living a life of perfect conformity to God's holy law in our place. Praise be to you for being obedient to death, even death on a cross, to redeem us from sin. Cause our voices to blend with those who sang your praises as you rode into Jerusalem. Move us to confess you before others as our Lord. Help us proclaim the message of peace and forgiveness to people of all nations. And use us to assure all people that your blood has cleansed them from sin and set them free from slavery to sin, death, and the devil. Move us to dedicate all that we are and all that we have to your glory. Lord Jesus, you are king over all the earth. Bless the nations of this world with wise rulers and good government. Let peace prevail. Grant success to the businesses and industries of our land to serve for the common good. Cause all employers to be honest and fair-minded and all employees to be diligent and faithful. Look with favor on our nation's schools. Be with those who teach and those who learn. Comfort the sick and the afflicted with the assurance of your care and protection and strengthen the faith of the dying. O Lord, you are the great physician of soul and body. You chasten and you heal. We pray that you would look with mercy on your servant, Reverend Ed Lindemann. If it is your will, spare his life and restore his strength. You gave your son to bear our infirmities and sicknesses. Deal compassionately with your servant and bless any medical means employed on his behalf with your healing power. Be with his family and give them strength and comfort from the promises that you have given not only to him, but to us all through your kingship, through your reign, through your sacrifice, through your death and your resurrection. We commit him to your gracious mercy and protection. 
for you are a faithful and merciful God. Dear Savior, as we walk with you this week toward Calvary, keep us focused on your purpose for coming into this world and on our calling to spread this wonderful message of salvation. Hear us for your mercy's sake as we also join to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May be seated for the next hymn.
Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation, and bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Sunday for watching the Wells Connection, and I mentioned that first because I neglected to get it started, so if our video crew wants to kind of scramble to get that, the disc should be underneath there. Pray for God's blessings on each one of us this Palm Sunday, that we would be filled with that joy of seeing our Savior who goes forward willingly for us. And may this week, this Holy Week, be a blessing to each one of us, to, to each one of us. Uh, as we ponder the great sacrifice our Savior has made for us. Take note of the, the special services and all those times uh, that are listed in the bulletin for Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday. Also want to thank uh, Emma Washala, didn't hit her name in the bulletin, for uh, playing with pre-service music today. And then also, uh, yesterday we had planned to hand out uh, door hangers around our community, inviting to the Easter services and to... Uh, the, the Dorcas uh, drive through Easter breakfast, but with the rain yesterday, that got, has gotten pushed off till this afternoon at 1.30. So, um, again, all who are willing to come and help with that, invite our friends and neighbors in our community to, to worship with us on Easter and to, uh, and to uh, partake in the breakfast as well that we're, being, that we're offering to them. Um, so we'll meet at 1.30 in the Activity Center entrance by Pastor Lindemann's office over there. Again, may God's rich blessings be with each one of you. Are we getting close? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. We'll watch our Wells Connection in just a moment here. Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. Did you know that the oldest Lutheran high school in the United States is Lutheran Preparatory School in Watertown, Wisconsin? But, of course, it's more than just a high school. Luther Prep has a mission of encouraging and preparing the next generation of Wells pastors, teachers, and staff ministers for 155 years and counting. At first glance, Luther Prep looks much like any top-tier high school, with quality instruction, state-of-the-art classrooms, and a full slate of extracurriculars. Right now I'm doing, I'm an RA in the dorms during study hall, I've got, I'm in the fall play, um, I'm playing football, I'm in the prep singers, I mean, I'm able to do all of that at the same time while also being around Jesus. 
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. It's the connection to Jesus that sets this school apart. Because LPS is designed to be a key step in a lifetime of service to God's people. A mission that's been unchanged for 155 years. And I think that's what, like, what's, what makes our synod special because you see a consistency there and you see the same faith and you see the same passion for the gospel. Because the students here come from all over the country and the world, most live in dormitories on campus. That might seem like a hardship, but it actually fosters maturity and builds even stronger ties between parents and children. You will actually feel that you are closer to your child after the prep experience and closer to your child for the rest of his or her life. My faith has grown so much that I can have these higher level conversations with them about like God and thoughts that I'm having. Living on campus also builds deeper friendships with like-minded young people who encourage each other in their Christian faith. It's a truly incredible experience. You'll see You'll see not only uh, your faith growing, you'll be able to see the faith within your friends growing too, which is an incredible thing to witness. It just makes it so much easier to be away, like then you don't even realize that you're gone, and it's just, this becomes the home basically. Previously, their place of worship had of course been their primary. In a world that seems especially unstable this school year, it's comforting to know that the next generation of pastors, teachers, and staff ministers are as committed as ever to bringing the gospel of Christ to a world in need. They realize there are a lot of things going on in the world right now that show even greater the need that, that we have for a Savior. That need for people to go proclaim the Christ publicly in the classroom and from the pulpit will always be there and it's just very evident today. Currently, students at Luther Prep come from 25 states and six countries. Diversity that adds to our strength as we reach out in Jesus' name to people across cultures and around the world. With more than 400 students, Luther Prep's enrollment remains strong, preparing the new generation of faithful leadership for our congregations and schools.